Okay, here we go. My name is James Pitt, and this is about semantic Ethereum. And um, when you talk about semantic or se semantic technologies like the semantic web, um, it starts with metadata. So, you, so what is metadata? Um, it provides context to the data that you have. And so when you're marking up HTML, you're, you're um, creating context for the data that you've included in your web page. And, it, and that context can run very deep. And regular metadata that we usually deal with as HTML developers, um, it, it's, it's a bit of a burden when you do it. But if you want to go to something like the semantic web, it has, it's a quite a big endeavor. So the semantic web was proposed by Tim Berners-Lee, who created the web. And when the person who created the web proposed, proposes a new idea, a new concept, a new set of standards, we're inclined to pay attention to him because we're grateful and it's, he's a genius. So um, a lot of people got very excited. And I, I drunk the Kool-Aid myself. I got extremely excited about it. And so he started with Web of Content, which is the current web. And then he, would, he expanded it to be a web of data and a web of trust. And as we all know, we're solving the trust aspect of this. Um, and the deeper sense of what he's talking about is that once you establish all this context, and once you know the source of the context, you, you, you create something that's almost a, not so much of a thinking vein, but something that is meaningful, that, that all the information is connected together in a very formal way. Um, and that can make, that made a lot of people very excited. And the W3C, which, um, which maintains its standards of the web, developed the standards of the semantic web, and many, many tools came out, standards, um, lots of interesting diagrams like that to describe how things connect together. Uh, um, but it largely failed. And you'll find many articles about how the semantic web was a complete bust. But the thing is, there, there's, there's a lot of standards that are out there, um, but they just weren't useful for people and they were a bit of a burden to work with. Um, and famously, Cory Doctorow, even before the semantic web was really formally a set of standards, he actually took on just metadata itself, the whole concept. He said it's meta crap and uh, very snarky, but is very insightful too. Um, he talked about insurmountable obstacles, uh, lies, laziness, stupidity, impracticality, um, and it's a great article if you look it up, The Seven Straw Men of Meta Utopia. Um, we ourselves are utopians in a way, so we can learn a lot from people who just simply say things like that. Um, perhaps Tim Berners-Lee should have listened to that a little bit. Um, but the thing is, even though the semantic web is a failure, or perhaps not, because people are still working on it, um, metadata is ubiquitous. Anyone who's worked with web pages knows. Um, and the, the simple fact is apps share data and that data has important context. And uh, much of the data as, as uh, web developers know is, is embedded in HTML and that's the standard microdata. Um, API calls are out there and the documentation behind API, API calls can be considered metadata. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why we must maintain great documentation. Um, and much of, this, of, of the semantic web is out there, um, not really forming a full semantic web, not really forming something that everyone uses, but it's out there and it, um, it's useful. For example, Wikipedia has been converted into a database and you, you can, so Wikidata, you can go in there and pull a lot of data, relate things together, it's very useful. Um, so often we use metadata without really realizing it, for example, the emails that you receive in Gmail about your flight actually contain um, tags, metadata, microdata in there, and that's what Google will generate from, those, from that microdata and GitHub actions. Um, often when you do search results, you'll see these little info boxes, which are somewhat controversial. Google grabs this data from various places and actually creates a summary, much like Wikipedia. Um, and yeah, those are called info boxes. So the thing about, there's, a, there's sort of a conundrum about metadata in general is um, if, if, you're, 
if you're too loose about it, it it's, you're not clear, right? A famous lawyer said, what, you know, what is is? What is the definition of is? Um, sometimes we can be unclear. Um, so, and it can lead to ambiguity. Um, and if you overstructure data, of course, it's burdensome. Um, and here's some well-known pedantic characters. Um, if you think about the personality, people who keep correcting you and saying, you can't say it that way, you know, this, um, you can't do it that way. S too much structure is annoying and developers don't want to deal with it, right? So um, let's go look at what the semantic web is, right? Highly formalized metadata. So it's, it's very strict. So whether something conforms to, to uh, what, what your ontology is or not is really clear. Um, it's layered on top of the open web, lots of standards, data, and tools. Um, and here's the things that it provides. It's really important is um, there's linkage and uh, there's lots of reference um, through your eyes. Um, the other one is um, the descriptions, like how, what things are. And um, like somebody is a person, um, what is a person? Well, you might have a resource that describes what a person is. Sounds ridiculous, but if you want to do something more automated, it might be good to know that this object is a person and this object is an airplane. Um, and the deeper side of it is reasoning, um, that you structure your data in a way that something can reason about it. Um, and so here's why. This is what Tim Berners-Lee wanted, and this is what he was proposing. This is why we all go through this, this work to build a semantic web, which many people didn't. Um, and ideas, software agents, that's a big one. Um, the, the notion was that if we all have the structured data out there, something could comprehend it and create um, automated services for us. Arrange airplane flights, agents, um, things like that. Uh, and um, I, think, I think one of the more interesting aspects of it was like an ecosystem, a value chain of data. If all the data is more formally connected, you can, you can build things on top of it reliably. And in a way, that's one of the great benefits of smart contracts. So, I'll give you the, I'm going to go over an interesting example. Um, some, uh, there's a tool called Protege, and that's how you create ontologies. And Protege, the people that did Protege did a really humorous um, ontology called Pizza. And this, this Pizza ontology will help you bake the perfect pizza data, and you can't violate it. Like, you can't put a hamburger bun on top of that thing and call it a pizza. And you can actually validate this, verify this thing. Um, so, think about linkage. Um, so here's some standards that, that deal with linkage, and you have URIs, which we're all familiar with, but there's actually really specific ways to use URIs, um, and XML namespaces. And you've probably seen these things in a lot of HTML, you don't know what they are, but essentially these are defining um, with, with these URIs what these names, namespaces are as they're used later on in this HTML, or in this case, in this RDF. And you can see down here how they're utilized, how these namespaces are utilized. Um, like right there, you have a Creative Commons license, and you can see right there, terms, license, what, is a ter what are terms, what is a license? Well, something automated can go up here and, and look at and, and go to that URL and go find out what terms are. And if you go to that URL about terms, you can learn and see data about what those terms are, if that URL still works. That's the problem with the web, is that these URLs might not work anymore. Often, um, these servers go down. Um, so descriptive meaning. Um, it's, it's essentially symbols, like what, what is describing what, what is the name of something, and it, it seems silly to us because we just talk and we understand this stuff. But, you know, uh, something automated really, it's, it, it has to know. So an assertion that we might make as Los Angeles is a city, the assertion on a semantic web would be broken up like this. Subject, predicate, object. This object is a URI. It's really clear what Los Angeles is. It's a type of, and all this stuff right here, this, is at the basis of a standard called RDF. This is called a triple. And RDF is all about declaring many, many, many triples 
to, to create something that's meaningful. And, it's, and, and then it even connects. So this, uh, descriptive meaning standards, how, how it would be expressed in the pizza ontology. So you have toppings, right? You want to talk about what a topping is. It's a functional property, an ingredient of pizza. Um, and this is how you would declare that for a machine. A machine could possibly understand what a topping is. Not that the machine understands what a topping is, but the machine would be able to interact with topping data in a way that is reasonable, right? Um, it's, as a developer, it seems ridiculous, however, that you go through this effort to help something automated. Um, so to take it one step further, and it gets further and further and deeper and deeper, the more you dig in, structural meaning, um, to be able to reason about something, you have to know how these things might relate, how these entities that you're talking about, pizza, toppings, mushrooms, how they might relate, and what is appropriate. Like, it might not be appropriate to put a pizza as a topping on top of a mushroom and still call it a pizza. That's not valid. Um, to us, that's ridiculous, but to a machine, that really might count if it's making pizza. So here's how the standard might come, come about. There's, there's something in, 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 uh, in the ontology standard, W3C OWL, that's called transitive property. Now, here, this is the almost philosophical notion about it. Oh, it is philosophical. Ingredients of ingredients are ingredients of the whole. And the idea is that you've, you have an ingredient on a pizza. That ingredient may have a sub-ingredient, but that sub-ingredient is still an ingredient of the pizza. And it's amazing, but you have to tell a machine about that. Otherwise, it's going to get very confused and possibly make a pizza that isn't, isn't going to work out, right? So here's, here's how that looks. Again, as a developer, I might be terrified of this, um, but I might use a tool that would generate this. Um, not enough tools are out there that are easy to deal with. Not enough tools are out there generating this kind of thing. So here's, here's, a, here's one of my favorite topics, these crazy pizzas they make in places like Taiwan and Japan, probably Hong Kong. This pizza has little baby hot dogs, little ketchups on top of each baby hot dog, and then you can kind of see the logic. Um, now, if you want to make an automatic pizza make baker, it's, it could use that ontology and potentially make this pizza and still be a valid pizza according to the ontology. But it's kind of ridiculous. That's why I chose this. Um, really, it's, it's pedantic. Like, it's, it's, it's too much work. And that's Manu Sporni called it right there. And he actually uh, worked on many standards at, at, the, at the W3C. Um, and he started Digital Bazaar, which is a really interesting company right now. And I consider him sort of an anti-hero. He developed a new standard called JSON-LD. And the idea is that you're going to add context to data with a lot less work as a developer. Now, JSON-LD is becoming a very important standard. Like, for example, the, in, uh, Google accepts it if you're an airline and you want, you want the, the uh, flight tickets to show up in your email that way. Google will accept JSON-LD. So JSON-LD is becoming quite, quite a large standard. And here's what it looks like. It's a lot less ponderous than the RDF that you saw earlier. It's not XML, it's JSON, very developer friendly. But it still has a lot of elements that are semantic or um, uh, provide context. Um, so when you think about semantic Ethereum, um, like what's the appropriate level? How far do we want to go? I, I consider it, I'm thinking about it, and I think it's important to, to foster creativity, but not to overdo it, right? Just enough for, for us to have composability. And, and, you know, this is a good metaphor. You create a standard for Lego brick, but you let people build whatever they want with it. But you need to have some structure. Um, and Ethereum obviously has a lot of metadata involved, the addresses, signatures, um, uh, token balances, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have identity claims. The URIs are associated there. In the descriptive side, you know, you have um, ABIs, documentation, of course, and structure enforced in the EBM. Like, you, you can have uh, as many objects as you want, and you know that nobody is going to mess around with it if it's done right. Um, so one of the reasons why we, we should put more metadata, if possible, into our 
work um, is the permanency of it. We might not be around, and this, this application is still being used um, in the future. And obviously, ecosystem. Uh, thinking about tokens or identity, these, these are, and identity itself is potentially creating great ecosystems. Um, you, cr you create these footholds when you do metadata, when you do it right. Um, and Swarm itself is actually quite an opportunity because um, you can use JSON-LD in there and you can connect, connect all these things together. Like right now we're thinking you'll, you'll refer to JSON-LD that's hosted on Swarm in your contract, but you should do it the other way around too so that all your documentation, all your data, all your contracts, everything, somebody could figure it all out even if you're not there to explain it, even if your documentation is on the web that no longer exists. Um, so the lessons are pretty clear. Um, be light, be light about standards. Um, if, if we have standards, it's more like documentation and we really encourage people to do it, it's fun. Um, and the, the key is steal the good stuff from the W3C because they really do have a lot of good ideas. We don't have to do it all, but just explore it and you'll find that there's, there's a lot of very interesting stuff in there. Um, just don't explore it too much because it's quite overwhelming, it's, it's ridiculous sometimes. Um, but still, the vision of it is quite amazing, it's, it's very interesting history. So that's it, um, hope this helps you make your applications. That's it, so.